questions generated um, by Rydberg dressing. And just for um, uh, context, I'll mention we also employ another approach that I won't talk about today, which is combining global interactions mediated by photons um, with local rotations. And if you're curious, you can read about that here. Um, so I've given a bit of sort of background of uh, why we might want to engineer squeeze states using Rydberg interactions. Um, and so let me say a little bit more about the approach we use, um, which is Rydberg dressing. I'll then um, discuss um, a couple of experiments, um, first um, characterizing the interactions and applying them to squeeze. And then I'll talk about some um, prospects, both in sort of Hamiltonian engineering for enhancing squeezing. Um, and if I have time, I'll say a little bit about directions in optimization and computation that could be uh, future directions. OK. so. Um, We've heard already in this conference about a couple of different ways of kind of um, mapping, uh, encoding some kind of interacting spin system um, in, in Rydberg atoms. So your two spin states might be the ground state and the Rydberg state. Um, they might be a Rydberg S state and a P state to give you dipolar interactions. Um, but in our case, um, we'll be talking about neither of those. We'll be thinking about spins that are encoded in um, the ground states and using light to optically induce um, interactions by admixing a bit of the Rydberg character by off-resonant coupling to a Rydberg state. So this is this method called Rydberg dressing. Um, and the key features are you can kind of um, turn on interactions that are on just when the light is on. Um, you have optical control. And at the same time, as soon as you turn the light off, you have kind of stable, long-lived ground states, which can be um, nice for metrological applications. So this idea of Rydberg um, dressing has been considered in a number of um, theoretical papers. One of the seminal ones was by Guido, who's here. Um, and it's also um, been explored in several experiments in the community, um, often motivated um, by applications in, in computation or many-body simulation. Um, so there was a landmark um, demonstration of a, a two-qubit gate um, at Sandia a number of years ago. Um, there have been studies of um, the dynamics of Ising interactions induced by Rydberg dressing in 2D lattices. Um, in the uh, Princeton group, there's been work actually combining these dressed interactions um, with a fermionic Hubbard model in order to have the combination of hopping plus um, longer range interactions. Um, and um, in the Gross group in Tübingen, and I think we might hear more about this today, um, there's been work on really kind of um, generating designer Heisenberg interactions by using the control that one has of the interactions with light um, uh, and being able to kind of engineer flip-flop and flip-flip processes um, uh, using this method of Rydberg dressing. Um, those first few things I talked about are in fairly controlled settings, two atoms and tweezers, um, one or two D arrays and lattices. Um, there have also been experiments in sort of dense 3D systems or in bulk gases where the focus of the experiments was actually um, observing um, somewhat disappointingly that the dynamics were dominated by loss processes that prevented observing coherent interactions. Um, so on the other hand, this loss problem actually is something that it would be nice to be able to solve if you want to be able to work in sort of systems with scalable particle number that are of interest for metrology. Um, and so um, we uh, started looking at, you know, can we solve this and actually access coherent um, Rydberg dressed interactions um, in the setting um, of, uh, of a bulk gas. Um, so actually, our experimental platform, um, I'll kind of touch on sort of, you know, three different regimes. Um, I'll focus on experiments where we're working with an array of clouds of a few hundred atoms each. Um, I'll also touch on some past work for context, just looking at um, uh, uh, mean field interactions in a bulk gas. Um, and I should also mention that sort of we've always been motivated by um, directions in computation and simulation um, in, in tweezer arrays, but we sort of got sidetracked into, into this. But I'll say a little bit in the outlook about um, directions in computation. <laughs> so um, this current platform that we're working in, um, uh, so, so we have an array of about 10 ensembles. Each of them has 200 atoms. Um, and so um, sort of having this gas of many atoms is nice for having high phase sensitivity even without entanglement. Um, the dressing gives optical control of interactions and potentially that includes spatial and dynamical control. Um, and then another feature that can potentially be used in this platform is that um, if you want to do spin rotations, that's simply just a microwave um, uh, coupling on the clock transition in our case of cesium. Um, so that's the atomic level scheme. And when we um, turn on the light that couples us to the Rydberg state, so we use single photon excitation um, off-resonantly coupling to a, a, a P state. Um, and the way that you can think about what this light does is, well, the first thing it's going to do is introduce an AC Stark shift on the spin-up state. 
Um, and so if I have also if I have now two atoms and I think about a two atom level scheme, if the atoms are far apart, um, they'll just be an AC start shift, which if the atoms start to get close together is actually going to be suppressed by, by the fact that it's actually impossible to sort of simultaneously excite two atoms. And so once the detuning of this laser becomes comparable to the strength of the interaction between two atoms in this P state, the AC start shift is suppressed. And so that is going to give rise to effectively now an interaction between the spin up atoms when the light is on. Okay, and so one way that you can see this um, is actually, um, one way that this manifests is essentially, um, if I just think about the amine field picture, if I have a given atom and there are more spin up atoms nearby, um, it's going to feel a larger light shift than if there are fewer spin, atoms near, spin up atoms nearby. So if I think of sort of the local magnetization in some cloud of atoms, um, if, the, if it's higher, um, the precession rate um, will be different than if the local magnetization is lower, and that's going to give rise to a sort of twisting dynamics in the local magnetization of this cloud. Um, and you can think of, think of this as a manifestation of just Ising interactions between the spins. Okay, so these are actually um, data that we measured um, uh, a couple of years ago in this just setting of, uh, of a Rydberg dressed um, gas. Um, and just to say, zoom in a little bit more on actually how this type of measurement is done, this is essentially um, Ramsey spectroscopy um, with spin echo. And the idea of the spin echo is you want to take out any, effect, any overall AC start shift from the light and leave behind only any interaction induced phase shift. And so um, you can imagine sort of tilting the magnetization by some variable amount theta um, and using this, uh, spin e this Ramsey spectroscopy with spin echo to extract the interaction induced phase shift as a function of position in this cloud of atoms. Um, the phase shift is, is largest where the light is strongest. Um, and um, by plotting this kind of a Ramsey fringe for different tilts of our initial magnetization, we can see this twisting behavior um, where the strength of the twisting is governed both by you know, how long we evolve and, and how intense the light is. Um, you can also visualize that here um, with this color map where color indicates the phase of the precession. The vertical axis is the initial tilt. Um, and you can see this, um, uh, this strong uh, gradient from red to blue in the middle says where the light is strong, we have strong twisting. Okay, so um, good. So that shows that we can engineer these twisting dynamics, these Ising interactions um, at the mean field level. And um, this is of interest because actually precisely that twisting, if you now had it applied um, not to intentionally apply different tilts, but actually to sort of the quantum noise of some initial coherent state, um, should actually squeeze the quantum fluctuations. Um, by creating a state that's narrow along some funny axis here. So um, the idea of using Rydberg dressing to do this was first proposed in this seminal uh, paper by the group of Thomas Pohl. Um, and it sort of is inspired by a um, paper from actually, uh, by now, I guess, 30 years ago um, uh, from the group of Kitagawa, Kitagawa and Ueda, who sort of first wrote down this one axis twisting Hamiltonian as a mechanism for spin squeezing. Um, and one thing that I love about this paper is somewhere in the sort of at very end it says realistic schemes for doing this have yet to be found. And part of the reason why <laughs> um, sort of it wasn't obvious to them how you would do this is in practice is that this Hamiltonian, which is sort of the total spin squared, um, is not that natural a thing to get. It requires having all-to-all -all interactions that don't arise in that many physical systems, at least if you're thinking from the perspective of 1993. Um, so by now, there are a bunch of systems where you can get these all-to-all -all interactions, Bose-Einstein condensates, um, optical cavities, where photons mediate interactions, ion traps, where collective motional modes mediate interactions, and squeezing has been demonstrated in those contexts, and those were some of the points on the map I put up at the start of the talk. Um, but actually, um, a bunch more realistic physical schemes become open to you if you start to sort of generalize this notion to systems with local interactions, right? And that opens the door to squeezing in these, in these Rydberg systems, maybe in molecules, um, dipolar solid state systems. Um, and so, um, so, you know, can we do this? Can we use these local interactions to squeeze? In the context of the Rydberg system, um, um, if we can do it, it gives a nice way of having sort of arrays with local optical control of the entanglement. Okay. So the sort of um, challenge, aside from the fact that the interactions are local, which makes it maybe different from that textbook Hamiltonian, um, is this loss problem that I mentioned earlier, right? Um, and any sort of, if I have um, loss, and particularly any uh, sort of multibody loss process is going to add noise that could degrade my squeezing. Um, so what actually um, happens, I showed you we have the right mean field dynamics, but let me actually look a little bit about whether this light is causing loss. Um, so here's an early experiment where we did, where we prepared a coherent spin state. And to learn something about an, um, loss in the system, 
um, we uh, essentially just you know, apply some dressing light and, me and uh, measure a histogram of sort of um, the fraction of atoms in the spin-up state. Um, this is with, with no dressing is here in gray or with dressing is here in yellow. Um, and since only the spin-up atoms interact with the light, um, this gives us actually a very sensitive measurement of, of what fraction is lost that is insensitive to sort of total atom number fluctuations. Okay, and so um, we see you know, some loss and we also see some broadening and we asked, okay, you know, what can we do to make this better? Um, and, and so, okay, there are a couple of things that matter. One of the first things we asked, you know, we had picked some Rydberg state um, and you can ask, does it depend on which Rydberg state we use? Um, and so it turns out um, the answer is, is yes, actually the Rydberg state might matter. Um, so some of these early experiments, we've been operating near a firster resonance in cesium, and it turns out if you pick a higher lying Rydberg state with the same um, kind of C6 van der Waals interaction and do um, the same experiment at similar twisting strength, the loss is already improved. So that was one thing that was important for us, it's just the choice of state. Um, but even here, actually, um, if you um, sort of apply the light for longer and look more closely, um, there's still loss that turns out to be problematic for squeezing. Um, and so here we're now sort of, you know, we had a, have a better choice of Rydberg state. Um, and I'm looking at the same type of histogram. And I'm looking now in this array of micro traps where we have actually some inhomogeneous intensity of the dressing light across the traps, which allows us to sort of in parallel extract statistics about um, traps at different intensities. Um, and so in this case, I've plotted basically the width of this histogram as a function of the, the loss fraction. Um, so each point here is just a different trap in the array. Um, and you can see that you know, this slope um, of variance versus loss um, is uh, substantially larger than one. So this is a super Poissonian loss process that directly tells us that we're sort of losing atoms in, in groups. And so that's gonna be much worse um, in terms of being able to squeeze in terms of, because it's gonna add, add more noise than sort of a single body loss process would. Okay. Um, and this, um, uh, again, these loss processes have been sort of studied and interpreted in a number of other experiments. And the interpretation is that um, if I have um, even just a single atom that actually, rather than being sort of, you know, off resonantly coupled to the Rydberg state, actually um, decays from this P state that we're dressing with into some dipole coupled Rydberg state nearby um, by black body decay, um, then I'll have an atom sitting around in the Rydberg manifold that, that can induce strong interactions um, with its neighbors and shift the dressing light onto resonance. And so you can sort of get an avalanche where a single atom that is actually occupying a Rydberg state can cause an avalanche of subsequent decays across the entire system. And so one needs to be very careful sort of not to have even a single atom that gets excited. Um, so it turns out um, a, a solution to this in our system um, has been to, rather than having sort of a single long pulse of light, be careful to only turn the light on for a very short time. Um, and so we apply the light stroboscopically in a sequence that looks like this. So we have a sequence of short pulses separated by some delay. Um, and the idea is that this delay ensures that even if some atom is in the Rydberg state, it has time to be um, de decay or be expelled from the system by anti-trapping. And so now if we plot sort of this noise as a function of the delay, um, you'll see this, this decay on the time scale of kind of tens of microseconds um, that um, is consistent with those, any perturbatum that we do generate being lost from the system. Um, and so as long as the decay is kind of, uh, the delay is sort of order 100 microseconds, um, we are back to the level of, um, uh, of having just the, just the quantum projection noise, um, which is what you would see in the absence of the dressing light. Those are the gray points and the blue matches that. Okay, so um, having this, these short pulses with delays um, is important um, for ensuring coherence. And another thing that turned out to actually be um, very crucial in, in getting this um, to work is that also we pay attention to the shape of these pulses. So rather than just having a square pulse um, that could um, cause some non-adiabatic um, excitation uh, to the Rydberg manifold, in other words, there's some frequency component that's resonant, even though ideally your light is off resonant, um, as long as we smoothly shape these pulses, we're able to suppress this loss. Yeah, someone. Is it obvious why this reduced the decay? Um, why why it reduced the noise or the so yeah. The so the idea is sort of e what you would like is that you don't allow this sort of avalanche to build up, um, and so you only ever apply in this case the light for for a short amount. Essentially, you want the pulses to be shorter than whatever time it typically would take you to generate even a single atom in such a perturber state. Um, so then, first of all, the amplitude in a single pulse for getting such an atom is small, and also, if you were to get one, it sort of decays before, before the light is on longer and can excite more atoms. 
But so and, in yeah. this plot, the total, like the total time the expectation is on. Is, is fixed. This, yes, exactly. So this is good. So this is a fixed total um, duration of, of the dressing. So in this case, we always have you know, 48 pulses that are 600 nanoseconds long, and we just vary the spacing between them. So you're and so, waiting until they settle down to more stable states so that you don't oscillate avalanche. So yeah, so exactly. So first of all, you, you want the probability to even get such an atom in a single pulse to be small. But if it, if it does happen, you want time for it to decay. That's kind of the, the picture that um, I have in mind for this. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, and the time scale for, for this sort of noise, the, the wait time that you need for this noise to settle back down um, to the projection noise level is kind of what you would expect from the time scales of the Rydberg state lifetime and also um, atoms being anti-trapped. Yeah? You said that before you were close to a first resonant where the C6 was naturally at low principal quantum number already quite high, but then the loss got high and then you went to higher end. Yeah. Uh, do you have an understanding why it became better? So the, the rough understanding is uh, um, the or one kind of conjecture is if you look at the interaction potentials at short range, um, they're near the first of resonance, they're more complicated, there are some sort of molecular features, and so that might be that you're hitting some molecular resonance and creating additional multibody loss beyond this. That, that's one conjecture. At some level, you know, we saw that it got better and we decided <laughs> to go where things are better and keep improving them there, um, but yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Uh, and, and okay. I can kind of see that maybe this inhibits avalanches, but would it kind of still destroy coherence between the titles? I mean, if you still so, kind of so what up, you don't oh if you do go up, yeah. maybe you don't cause an avalanche, but maybe you still don't get the kind of nice coherent squeezing. So the coherence you care about is sort of for the for the ground. I mean, really, the dynamics you care about is for the ground state spins. Mm -hmm. So now, what could happen if I create one atom in a Rydberg state and then it's lost? Well, if I lose one out of two hundred atoms, it's oh, yeah. not a big deal as long as I'm not trying to squeeze by more than like a, by a factor of two hundred. Let's say, right? So um, uh, you might worry also that that atom could cause some um, phase shifts, like that the dressing light actually the interaction, the, the, yeah, that, that there's some phase shift on the ground state spins associated with that atom being in the Rydberg state. Um, to the extent that that's an effect, leaving this wait time also mm -hmm. can help. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Uh oh, I should have plugged in my laptop. So then. Okay. 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 Great. Um, so. So, so for now, when we, we use this, this stroboscopic dressing procedure with the shaped pulses, um, one thing we can um, do with this is now sort of more precisely actually characterize our interacting system. Um, and um, you can do this by, for example, measuring. Um, so this is a, just a Ramsey measurement of the AC Stark shift from the dressing light as a function of detuning, um, where I'm not doing any spin echo. I'm measuring the full um, AC Stark shift. And this is actually a nice way to get out sort of from the large detuning tail. Um, when I, I can know the Rabi frequency of my dressing light, but also what one sees is that um, what I'm plotting here is this AC Stark shift for different tilts um, of the magnetization. Um, and you'll see that essentially there's sort of this tilt dependence of the Stark shift, which is precisely this kind of twisting behavior, right? The, the different, there's a different spin precession rate for different tilts. Um, and that actually directly gives a measure. If you fit these, you can directly extract also um, essentially how many neighbors are, is each atom interacting with. So this is a kind of a nice way um, to characterize our system and to learn that although we have 200 atoms in the cloud, um, these fits tell us um, that uh, we typically have each atom sort of interacting with 13 of its neighbors. Um, and this is uh, roughly consistent with kind of the, our separate measurements of the density and the known interaction potential, which has a range of about five microns. Um, um, OK. And so in terms of this number of interacting neighbors, um, there's some mean field interaction strength which um, is roughly given by, by that number of interacting neighbors and scales with um, the Rabi frequency to the fourth. So it scales quadratically in the laser intensity and then has a detuning dependence. Um, OK, so now the picture I should then have in my mind is we have this kind of like actually each of these micro traps um, uh, you know, perpendicular to the beam propagation is, is kind of elongated. Um, and in that direction, um, the at a given atom you know, doesn't interact with the entire cloud. It interacts with these sort of, um, you know, 10-ish neighbors. Um, and so indeed, this is kind of, we have these sort of local interactions in this spatially extended system. And now we can ask, um, can we use them to, to squeeze? Um, and so here's, here's a measurement where we apply our full stroboscopic dressing sequence with spin echo pulses that take out the overall AC start shift 
um, and also various technical noise sources. Um, and if you want to know details of the pulse engineering, Jacob is the expert on getting low noise pulses that allow us to see the squeezing. Um, and right, and so this is just a plot of, of the noise as a function of sort of the angle by which we rotate the state about itself. Um, and we plot the Wineland squeezing parameter that says how much is the signal to noise enhanced compared to the best that's possible with this many atoms with no entanglement. Um, and this parameter is less than one, which says yes, we have enhanced sensitivity due to entanglement um, by uh, a, a factor of um, sort of 0.77 in this central ensemble. Um, and now, okay, so this is just zooming in on one ensemble, and now we can also kind of ask about the squeezing um, in the entire array. Before I do that, I'll just emphasize, again, two beautiful related squeezing results that have just come out are from the Kaufman group, which is, which is also using Rydberg dressing, um, but in uh, an optical tweezer clock, and the wonderful talk you heard um, uh, by Guillaume the other day, uh, yesterday. Okay, so this is squeezing sort of in the central micro trap. We can also now um, use this sort of parallel um, measurements in the array to say something about the dependence on the intensity of the dressing light. Um, so what I'm showing here, so the, this axis is sort of which micro trap we're looking at. Um, and um, the bottom plot in blue is showing the strength of the twisting, so the mean field interaction times time um, that we sort of independently calibrate, um, which, and, and which is set by the intensity of the dressing light. The beam profile seems to have been a bit funny in this data taking, in, in this data run, and, and so you know, it's not a perfect Gaussian, but that, that's what it is, and we can measure it. Um, and now, um, based on this strength of twisting, um, we can actually ask, just based on the model of one axis twisting, how much squeezing um, would you expect? Um, using this sort of, this blue region for the twisting strength turns into this green region for the amount of squeezing we'd expect, and also the orange region for how much anti-squeezing you'd expect in the orthogonal axis. Um, and the data that we measure um, uh, matches that quite well um, and is consistent with essentially the squeezing and, and, and the anti-squeezing being just governed by the local intensity. If the dressing light, um, for reference, the gray points are what we would have um, in the absence of light. We start out a little bit worse than the standard quantum limit. Um, part of that is finite contrast of, um, uh, 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 so essentially finite le length, imperfect contrast um, due to uh, in homogeneous broadening in the trap, so it's sort of unrelated to the dressing. Um, so we start a little bit worse than the standard quantum limit, but the dressing brings us below it. And now we can also kind of plot this directly versus the twisting strength um, and see that um, as we are increasing that strength of the interaction, primarily by the strength of the laser intensity, um, uh, the squeezing is, is so far getting um, better in a way that matches quite well to a model, which is just one axis twisting with a number, with sort of an effectively the size of our collective spin being set by the number of interacting neighbors, which in our case is 13. Okay, um, and, and accounting for this imperfect initial contrast. Um, you might ask sort of, why didn't we go further? It looks like it's getting better the stronger you, you twist. Um, and so, you know, one way to go um, to stronger twisting strength is just longer time and adding in more pulses. And it turns out because of this, um, these trap, inhomogeneous trap light shifts that aren't perfectly canceled um, due to atomic motion. Um, just having a longer sequence um, gives some overall loss of contrast, and so we kind of fixed our sequence time. Um, and then the other thing you could do is go to higher laser intensity, um, and um, sort of in retrospect, probably that's what we should be doing, and we have this large you know, defocused beam, um, but actually one simple thing that probably should already help is having a focused beam that scans across the ensembles. We, we're waiting anyway. <laughs> uh, uh, in the stroboscopic sequence, and so you could easily, um, in principle, easily do this. And that's something that I'd love to, you know, see this curve keep going down. Um, so um, if you sort of ask how much would you expect with no other changes than higher laser intensity, um, we'd expect about 5 dB of squeezing in this system, and that's limited by um, uh, kind of two effects um, that come in at a similar order. There's the finite range of the interaction, um, and there's also some inhomogeneity in um, the interactions because we have you know, this, this Gaussian cloud with an inhomogeneous density. Um, so if, just to give a sense, if you had you know, ideal one axis twisting with sort of um, uh, uh, the system size set by the number of atoms in the interaction sphere, that would give this green curve. Um, inhomogeneity makes that a little bit worse at the level of about um, a factor of three or five dB um, that we could expect to get. 
Um, and then if you want to go further, um, you'd like to make the system more uniform in density, and you could also make the system sort of more three-dimensional, have this cloud be actually larger in all dimensions than the interaction radius, um, to have a larger number of interacting neighbors, and those things would bring you to about this level of, of 10 dB. Um, and so I, I would say, you know, right now the squeezing is modest, but it looks like there's room for improvement, um, and, and, and there's room for improvement, and there's this really new feature of having the local control um, of the squeezing in the individual ensembles. Okay, so once you've sort of, you know, if, if all of this works and you get to the 10 dB level and you say, I want to do even better, um, we've been doing a little bit of um, thinking about sort of what sorts of games might one play in terms of Hamiltonian engineering to kind of optimize the squeezing. And this has been thought about also by a number of other groups. Um, and so sort of one key point, as I mentioned, sort of one limitation is just how many neighbors are interacting. And so why is that a limitation? If you have Ising interactions, essentially you can think of it as um, uh, I have a, a spin that processes at a rate that depends on whether its neighbors are up or down, right? And so the phase evolves according to whether the neighbors are up or down, but that will never affect the phase of another spin down, down the line, which is to say the correlations can't propagate across the entire system. Um, that's always true if I have sort of no non-commuting terms in my Hamiltonian. So there's been a number of works thinking about um, making interactions spread um, to get stronger squeezing um, in systems uh, that have, for example, Ising interactions plus a transverse field. Um, another thing you might think about um, is, you know, if I could somehow design my Hamiltonian, so for example, if I have a transverse field and I can quickly do different basis rotations, I could maybe make some more general XYZ model. Um, and ask, is there a way um, to, to enhance um, the spreading of correlations? Because I now can engineer effectively these non-commuting terms, or maybe to speed up the squeezing. Um, so these are all things that you can do if you could do some sort of floquet engineering and not just have the pure Ising interaction, um, but also have this, have this transverse field. And so one thing I want to mention, um, so this is past work, um, just looking at the mean field dynamics in the gas. In that setting, we've already realized sort of an effective transverse field Ising model, where the transverse field is just a microwave coupling between the clock states. Um, and so at the mean field level, the sort of manifestation of this is that as one sort of cranks up the intensity of interactions um, by varying the intensity of the light, um, you can see in the dynamics a transition from having a, uh, a system with a paramagnetic ground state, which manifests as a fixed point in the dynamics, to two ferromagnetic ground states, which manifest as two fixed points in the dynamics. Um, and this is something we were able to observe, to observe previously in the setting um, of, um, of this bulk gas. Um, OK, and so we sort of have these knobs, the Ising interactions, the transverse field. And now you could ask the question, um, if I can use those knobs to sort of engineer um, fancier Hamiltonians by some um, Floquet engineering, might, what might I want to do? Um, you know, so let's say I can make some general um, XYZ Hamiltonian by doing pi over two pulses that give me basis rotations. Um, you might want to fix this fact that if I have just the Ising terms, correlations can't spread beyond the interaction sphere. Um, and one um, sort of paradigmatic model for squeezing um, that has not just the Ising terms, but actually, um, essentially, you can think of it as a YY minus ZZ Hamiltonian, um, is this is known as the counter-twisting Hamiltonian. Um, and this has been thought about in the context of all-to-all -all interactions um, and has the feature that um, it's of interest because it's faster than just the twisting. It sort of squeezes exponentially. But it also has these non-commuting terms, so maybe it also has some benefit for short-range interactions. Okay, so one challenge is if you wanted to sort of engineer this, you'd need not only to do basis rotations that give you the Y and the Z interactions, but you'd also need to switch the sign of the interaction in some kind of stroboscopic way, and that sounds painful. So it turns out um, um, if you want to sort of go one step further, um, uh, suppose you were to add to this Hamiltonian an additional term that's just like a sigma dot sigma term. Um, so um, add to this an, sort of an isotropic Heisenberg term. This actually does two kind of cool things. One, in general, adding this kind of isotropic Heisenberg term, it gives you an energy penalty for um, sort of misaligning the spins, right? It's an energy this imposes sort of an energy difference between the triplet states of a pair of spins where the spins are aligned and the singlet state where they anti-align. So this can actually generally be a mechanism for sort of protecting the coherence of the system and preventing interaction-induced dephasing. Um, but another cute thing is if you sort of add this to this counter-twisting Hamiltonian, if you add such a term, um, you can actually have um, uh, something that you could engineer just by doing um, uh, Ising interactions plus rotations without needing to change the sign. Um, so actually, 
um, there's um, uh, uh, my former student, who's now here at Harvard, Nazla Koyloglu, has been doing some theory on um, sort of what would you expect in this, what we call the gap-protected counter-twisting model. So um, this sigma dot sigma term um, introduces this energy gap between states of different total spin that should protect the coherence. This should give you the fast squeezing. Um, and if you sort of look at this for simplicity, we thought about sort of power law interactions in different spatial dimensions. Um, and um, you know, we can, um, uh, for any sort of dimensionality we pick, let's look at 2D here. Um, there's some uh, critical value of this gap beyond which the squeezing works well and gives a Heisenberg scaling. Um, and um, these are, they're, this, they're sort of interesting regimes that could be implemented um, with either um, dipolar spins, 2D alpha equals 3, or also Rydberg dressed atoms, the closest thing on this plot would be um, the 1 over r to the 6 tail of the van der Waals interaction in, in say, three dimensions. This is also a regime where this um, gap protected counter twisting could work well. Um, so, just sort of for context, I should say, you know, you heard about squeezing with um, um, X, XY interactions or, or also sort of XXZ type interactions. Um, you can think of that as gap protected twisting. This is gap protected counter twisting. Okay. Um, so one kind of neat thing is you can actually predict um, just using sort of a spin wave calculations of the early dynamics, sort of the critical value for this gap um, that you need in order to get the Heisenberg scaling. Um, and you can also kind of understand why the squeezing works better above this critical strength of the gap um, by looking at kind of the spatial correlations in this spin wave calculation. And so I added the slide because we had a discussion at a poster yesterday about sort of what are the interesting things you could see in the spatial correlations in some of these um, lattice experiments um, in the context of squeezing. And the key thing is that sort of if you make this gap large enough, one goes from a situation where sort of, so here's a regime where the gap isn't big enough. Um, that's this plot on the right. You have sort of strong correlations at short range and they decay very rapidly. But if you make this energy gap large enough, you get a regime where you have sort of a plateau in the strength of correlations. They're actually weaker at short range, but they're sort of similar strength at all distances. And this sort of like similar strength correlation um, across a large range of distances is exactly what you want to have this sort of almost uh, similar dynamics to the all to all interactions. Um, so similar strength correlations at all distances. Okay, and so for any given atom number you're working with, there's some size of the gap that you need to have this plateau be big enough to extend across the total system. Okay, so this could be a fun thing to look at in various systems, for example, that people here are working with involving um, dipolar interactions in, in 2D. Okay, so um, I talked about um, uh, uh, these experiments on squeezing in our array of Rydberg dress clouds. I said a bit about Hamiltonian engineering, um, and if there's time I want to say a little bit more about prospects, but in case there's no time, I'm first going to summarize the um, main points of this talk. Um, so um, I've shown you um, this squeezing that is controlled by the intensity of the dressing light. Um, it's improving with increasing intensity, and so that looks um, promising for doing even better. Um, and um, the sort of directions you could go with this, um, this is setting of sort of an array of ensembles is ideal for, um, for example, um, these multiplex atomic clocks that could be enhanced by squeezing. This stroboscopic dressing could also be applied in the setting of tweezer clocks, like the experiments um, that um, hopefully some of you look at the poster from the Kaufman group. Um, and um, more generally, this gives you sort of figures of merit, such as um, spatial resolution, um, dynamic range. Um, so for beating um, local oscillator noise in clocks, um, having multiple ensembles to get more information um, could be valuable. Okay. But this dress, I mentioned the dressing is also of interest in quantum simulation, and so some of these tricks with stroboscopic dressing could help um, um, with some quantum simulation studying, for example, Floquet phases are very natural with this combination of um, optically switchable interactions and a transverse field. Um, there are proposals for studying frustrated magnetism, and maybe we'll hear more about that um, later in this session. Okay, so I'm going to sort of jump ahead because Misha is standing up. Uh, and just say that um, uh, you know one other direction we've been thinking about that takes advantage of Rydberg dressing um, are applications to quantum optimization. And if you want to hear about this, um, there's an, an NP-hard problem called number partitioning, which naturally maps to um, there's an implementation to solve this with Grover's algorithm. If you can build a central spin model, which would be natural to do with a Rydberg ad interacting um, with some surrounding Rydberg dress spins. Okay, so hopefully our progress in uh, Rydberg dressing could be applied towards uh, this application. I won't tell this story because we're out of time. Um, I will 
just briefly say um, uh, in, in sort of a quick one minute overview of other things going on in our group. Um, we've been exploring actually how to make, I mentioned, programmable entanglement using uh, not local interactions, but non-local interactions in an optical cavity. This is a method where in atomic ensembles, we're actually able to make sort of optically programmable graph states relying on strong collective atom-like coupling of atomic ensembles to a cavity. But we're also building a setup where the aim is to get sort of even stronger single atom coupling than is possible with ensembles in this optical cavity. And this will be something where the goal is to work with um, individual Rydberg atoms um, in a millimeter wave cavity. And maybe some of these ideas um, can be translated to really kind of quantum information processing with Rydberg atoms to access, for example, kind of programmable non-local graph states with some applications in error correction. So that's sort of a long-term prospect of some other things going on in the group, but I want to just conclude by thanking um, the team here in blue who did these Rydberg dressing experiments. And again, um, hard questions should be directed to, to Jacob, who's sitting there. Mm -hmm. So do you have some, uh, do you have like an understanding of how robust this would be in terms of like specifically, like when I see this like uh, distance dependent interactions, I kind of always worry, you know, about the, um, like this atomic movement and like uncertainty in position, which kind of just introduces like some sort of interaction disorder. And second, because you're using Floca engineering, you kind of necessarily have like heating terms from high yeah. things. So kind of these mm -hmm. things, do, do, do you know if this squeezing is robust to these kind of? So I think th these are both very good questions. Maybe I'll start with actually the second one. And I, I'll, I'll be honest, this is the thing that, that worries me the most about the Floquet engineering, because even without Floquet engineering, we you know, use a bunch of spin echo pulses in our sequence. And a lot of the hard work um, to see the squeezing at all goes into sort of making those pulses robust enough to any um, uh, uh, frequency or pulse length errors um, to sort of not add extra noise. And so a lot of thought goes into actually you know, choosing the right pulse sequence to be robust against those errors. So if you want to now apply this to Floquet engineering, you need, right, that's, that's even more critical. And so I think a really interesting question for you know, theorists in the audience, um, we haven't looked at robustness in the context of this um, counter-twisting story I told. Uh, I think it's a super interesting question for theorists in the audience. Can you sort of, are there tricks for making these Floquet engineering techniques robust to noise? Um, the motion is also one that um, I, don't, I haven't thought too hard about, but I will say that um, there's a sense in which um, there is some robustness to dephasing, at least, that comes from this sort of this gap protection. So by having this energy penalty um, for, for making the spins dephase. And so possibly that could actually help um, with robustness um, to motion, but it's not something we've simulated. I mean, in principle, these, high, these um, higher order terms could even like, help if you design it correctly in some sense, right? Like if you have interaction between like site one and two, and then like, like, like one and five, and then five and 10, you essentially establish a, like a three body term between involving both site one and 10. So it's, as long as it's like not detrimental, it could like even speed up squeezing. Yeah, I mean, in some sense, again, yeah, and, and you are trying to at least sort of make these correlations spread so that even distance sites sort of want to want to be aligned in some sense, right? That, and that's kind of what this S dot S term I kind of think of as doing. Um, yes, okay. yeah, yeah. No, but it, really great question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this Hamiltonian engineering, you can change the shape, but always you reduce the total strengths of interactions in, inevitably. So if you account that in fact, mm -hmm. yeah. is your Hamiltonian engineering really helping? Yeah, yeah, so actually one thing we've looked at is for, so now I guess the question is what do you compare to? And one of the things we've looked at is um, you can sort of say, assume, let's assume I make this by um, sort of trotterizing an XY Hamiltonian. Would I rather have the XY Hamiltonian or would I rather have this fancier Hamiltonian that we engineer? And so there um, the conclusion is that um, in terms of the sort of real interaction time, um, at least at short, at sort of at short times, the squeezing is faster. And also at long times, the squeezing is better. So far, we've seen a funny intermediate regime where it seems like the, the native, there's some intermediate time where the native XY looks better, um, which I, I don't claim to fully understand. That's, that's but because, yeah. It's because basically, yeah, it's actually kind of, yeah, we can talk about But at least the sort of initial effect it, is, is because yeah, it's, faster. Um, like this kind of gap protection term, it actually 
basically, you know, it kind of projects into this kind of tries to project into symmetric manifold. Right. Actually, it reduces effectively interaction strength. Sure. Yeah. 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 So, of course. But the gap protection, yeah. in some sense, sorry, it's there in either case, right? In either the X Y or the yeah, yeah, counter twisting, you can yeah, sort of add a tunable gap protection exactly. term, and then but the question you can ask is sort of, yeah. But that, you know, that for is, any given time I have available, you can sort of pick the optimal gap and then see how well you squeeze. Yeah, yeah. but and, I, I yeah. think it is actually kind of practice often that if you have, for example, the coherence, like, right, I mean, yeah. kind of uncorrelated, it's actually kind of, it's, it's a kind of a little bit of a problem. Oh, yeah. And so, sorry, yeah. And so I, I think, yeah, I don't have the plot here, but one thing you can ask is, again, I have a fixed time I can work with, and how should I optimally yeah. choose this gap? And obviously, if you're limited by some decoherence at yeah. short times, you might not want it at all. But if you're limited by the interaction-induced dephasing, then you want it. Right. And yeah, and so you can kind of pick it. Yeah. Two questions. One is, um, is the NC equals 13 the critical number? Does it agree with what you expect from your cave radius and density? Yes. And yeah. At least within like a factor of one and a half or something. Yeah. And then the process, how often you generate these avalanches? Can you quantify it? Is it, you know, one percent? Does it matter? Or something? You know, um, how, how often does it happen, essentially? So, yeah, so in the actual, okay, I guess the question would be sort of how often does it happen when we actually, when we optimize things and do this, okay, so when we do the stroboscopic dressing sort of on the time scale of our experiment, we don't see added noise. Um, if we don't do the stroboscopic dressing, um, then, you know, I think maybe if I go back to, um, this picture. Okay, um, oh, I have my own comments here. I hope there's nothing embarrassing right now. Okay, if I look, go back to this picture, um, I believe this total time is sort of a twisting strength of a few. Does that sound right, Jacob? Um, and so you can kind of see um, if I say this G is basically telling me um, sort of in what size groups I'm losing the atoms. And so it's saying we've lost 10% of the atoms, and they're being lost, it, it, which is 20 atoms, and they're being lost in groups of about 20. And so it's actually, this is roughly saying it's, it's just like a couple of these events. It's sort of order one event in a twisting strength of a few, but there's a bunch of atoms lost. And the range of influence, if you do generate one of the atoms in this, these nearby dipole coupled states, the range of influence is something like 10 microns, which is most of the system. So, yeah. All right, I think we are. Just 10 minutes to go behind the stage. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay.